if you're on your summer holidays now, why don't we take a little break together, just a short trip to outer space in the brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name is Dan, welcome to the show. We explore the universe, everything out there, to find some of those science secrets lurking that you won't hear anywhere else. Now this week, we're digging, we're chatting to archaeology expert Letty Ingray about her fascinating finds. There's a lot that actually happens before you can go and dig. It's not just about finding the artefacts or the stone tools. It's really important that you know exactly where things come from. So you've got to make sure you have a team of people who know how to recognise deposits, who know how to record the artefacts you find, where you find them. So that's really important. And you can head to the smartest school in the solar system, hearing all about weather close by to us that's still miles away. Mercury. This is the baby of Earth's solar system and closest to the sun. Even though it has a magnetic field which protects the surface from solar winds, I'm not sure I'd want to visit. Yeah, it says the temperature out there is 400 degrees Celsius. That's four times as hot as boiling water. I've also got your questions today. They are two that might keep you up at night. It's coming up in a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's kick things off with your science in the news. The extreme temperatures sweeping the globe will be the new normal, scientists say. The UN Weather Agency says that due to the climate crisis, temperatures went over 50 degrees C in the US and China last week. Europe is having a massive heat wave, which scientists will say will last into August. It kind of feels real right now. We're seeing, especially here in the UK and in America and China, summer's getting hotter year on year on year. We can feel the climate crisis happening and changing all around us. Also, India has launched its third moon mission, trying to be the first to land near its South Pole. The Chandrayaan-3 spacecraft launched the other day, and it's the fourth country to have made a soft landing on the moon. That's what they hope. We don't know much about the South Pole up there. Spacecrafts tend to land in the same place on the moon, so going to the South Pole means we can explore more of it. It's a good idea to send things into space, I think, but we need to think about the fuels and how eco-friendly we are exploring other things in the solar system when ours is struggling down here. And finally, experts have been digging up more stuff around Pompeii. It's an ancient city completely destroyed when the volcano nearby, Mount Vesuvius, erupted back in 79 AD. Because so much of it is buried, lots has been preserved. Scientists the other day found a kitchen shrine with serpents, human skeletons and even a bakery in there. And if you love digging stuff, you can hear from an actual archaeologist who digs things up later on in the show. Let's catch up with Techno Mum then, our gadget genius. She knows everything about technology, how it's used, why it's there, how it can impact our lives. And she answers all of your questions. We're talking about money this week with Tim and Techno Mum and the interesting technology used in something we do every day, like paying for things in the shop. Techno Mum with the Institution of Engineering and Technology, advancing and sharing technology. I'd finally done it, saved enough to get the Turbo Gadget Turbo Jet, the coolest model jet in the world. And today it was going to be mine, all mine. And it was a good job we went shopping today. I got the last one off the shelf. Well done, Tim. Let's get to the till. You sure you got enough? Why not give it all to me so I can put it safely in my purse? Good idea. There's all these coins for starters. £26 exactly. That's 26 weeks of saving £1 a week. And then there's that money I found down the back of the sofa that you said I could keep. And that's another five pounds in change. Gosh, that's quite a big bag of coins. And then there's the money from Grandad for washing his car. And my birthday money. That makes up the difference. Hang on, you've got a check in there. You won't be able to hand that to the person at the till. Why not? It's got an amount of my name on it. Oh, that's ruined it then. I won't have enough. Don't worry, I'll pay with my debit card and we'll put all of your cash and the check in the bank afterwards. What is a debit card? Is it like a credit card? Sort of. They're both ways of paying, just electronically. Not with all this. They're a lot lighter to carry around too. Phew. Money is one area where technology really has made things simpler. 
There's a chip on the card here, you see. It holds the detail of my bank account. So when the card is read, the till contacts the bank, checks if I've got enough money, and debits it. That means takes the money away and puts it into the shop's bank account. Is that the chip in the chip and pin they talk about? So what's the pin? The personal identification number. It's just a numerical password to make sure it's definitely me using the card. What about those people you see just swiping their cards? Ah, well, those have a different sort of chip in them. It's a tiny electromagnetic chip that talks to the card reader without having to touch it. It's done through radio waves or near-field communication. Oh, right, like the oyster cards on the tube got it in one. The same technology is in mobile phones too these days, so you might be able to pay using your phone in the future. I could see that it would definitely be handy to shop as much as you like without even having to carry a card with you, but then I remembered when Dad dropped his phone down a drain in Spain. But what if you lost your phone like Dad did on holiday? Would all your money just disappear? No, silly, because the money isn't in your phone, it's still in the bank. These are all just ways of talking to your bank account. Think about the internet shopping we do to get our supermarket delivery. I can't post coins into the laptop. Maybe one day coins and notes won't even exist anymore. No way! No money? How will I get pocket money if fivers don't exist? We just transfer the money over the internet to your account. Phew, that's all right then. Presuming you've done your jobs, of course. Techno Mum, with the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Advancing and sharing technology. Let's get to your questions then. I love this part of the show. Every week, I get to do the digging, just like our guest, and uh, not in the mud. I look through books, I look online, watch videos, read loads, get to learn all about the science questions that you need answering. Send me yours as a voice note on funkidslive.com or you can do it through the free Fun Kids app. Here's one that's been sent in as a review for the Fun Kids Science Weekly on Apple Podcasts from someone who calls themselves, I am a blue person. Hmm. They want to know, why do sharks have so many teeth? On average, sharks have between 50 and 300 teeth. Now, most grown-up people, adult humans, have about 32 teeth, so sharks have way more, more than double normally. A lot of their teeth are curved backwards. Some have two little points, so when a shark has got its prey, it won't let go. It's death by a thousand cuts. Also, teeth are all they have to rely on for food. Uh, They don't have claws like a big cat. They can't jump. They can't leap. They can't really hide. They have to make sure their teeth are strong and sharp and work. So their teeth grow back quite quickly because of this. They have almost a conveyor belt of teeth moving forward in their jaw all the time. So when one set gets broken or stops being so sharp, a new set moves into their place. Thank you so much for the question. I am a blue person. Brilliant name. Here's one from Oswin in Surrey who wants to know, what is sleep paralysis? Sleep paralysis is when you're awake but can't move your body. The proper name is Atonia. Scientists don't really know why it happens. Seems quite scary, though. Imagine waking up, but you can't do anything. You can't move. You're just thinking. You're watching. You're waiting. So your brain has kind of woken up, but it's not told the rest of your body that it needs to wake up too. Normally, you're in a kind of half sleep. Your brain is active, but a bit in the world of dreaming, which means you often get vivid hallucinations, which makes things scarier. You can see things that aren't there around you. Now, on average, sleep paralysis lasts for about six minutes. They can last for a full 20 minutes, though, before your brain kicks in the rest of your body and gets that working again. Thank you so much for the question, Oswin. If you have something you want answered on the show next week, I'd love to hear it from you. I'd love you to be a star of the podcast. So on a phone or a tablet, get the free Fun Kids app. You can record yourself there and you can do it too at funkidslive.com, ready for next week. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly and we're digging things up this week. An archaeology team have found some of the largest early prehistoric stone tools ever discovered in Britain. And it's a big deal. Letty Ingray is from University College London and worked on the excavation. Letty, thanks for joining us. Hi, hello. Just tell us, how early and old is early prehistoric? What time are we talking about? Well, early prehistory actually starts over three million years ago when you get the earliest stone tools. Those tools are in Africa But in Britain, the earliest stone tools we have here are nearly a million years old. That's quite hard to get your head around because I thought that us humans, Homo sapiens, were only 
200,000 years old. Who was walking the planet then needing stone tools? You're right. Homo sapiens are only about 200,000 years old. But Homo sapiens aren't the only species of humans who's ever lived. So before then, there used to be quite a few different species of humans, species like Neanderthals or Homo hydrobagensis, Homo antecessor, just some of the species of humans that probably used to live in Britain. So this is amazing what you found. Just tell us... How you go about finding it? Where do you know where to look for stone tools? You can't just dig anywhere. No. So what we do is we look at places where we know that the ground is made up of deposits that happened while we know humans were living in Britain. So at the site where we found these stone tools, we already knew there were lots of sands and gravels on the site that were put there by a river that was there hundreds of thousands of years ago. So we thought, well, there are these sands and gravels there and we know that humans were living in Britain at that time. So we dug some holes in the sands and gravels to try and see if we could find any evidence of these humans that were living in Britain. Now, you did it with a proper team. What needs to happen before you can go out with your spades and start digging? Do you need to write a letter to someone? Do you need to put ropes around where you want to dig? Just talk us through that part of it. So there's a lot that actually happens before you can go and dig. So with archaeology, it's not just about finding the artefacts or the stone tools. It's really important that you know exactly where things come from. So you've got to make sure you have a team of people with people who know how to recognise deposits, who know how to record the artefacts you find, where you find them. So that's really important. Um, it also can be quite dangerous digging these holes. So some of these holes were quite deep, so up to four metres deep. So it can be quite dangerous unless you do it with proper fencing, kind of proper equipment that you have to wear. We all wear things like hard hats, boots to protect our toes, everything like that. And also, because these holes were so big and so deep, we didn't dig these by hand. We actually had a man with a a machine. Um. (laughs) So, yeah, it actually takes takes quite a lot of work to to find sites like this. Wow, big up to the digger-upper, Simon. (laughs) So he's done his work with the big machine, lifted up all this earth. What did you find? So we found a lot of stone artefacts. So these are artifacts made from flint, which is a kind of stone. But when you break it, you get a really sharp edge. So the edge of flint, when it's broken, is actually as sharp as any knife you'll have in your kitchen. It's really sharp, really good for cutting. So we found a lot of tools like this, where people in the past had taken a piece of this stone flint and hit it with another stone to create stone knives out of it how much are you still surprised by what you find when you're digging or do we kind of know everything that people and different species were using way back in the past and this is just saying yeah we were right we know they had stone tools or is it still a surprise it's it's always very exciting when you find stuff like this because it's actually quite hard to find And it's not very often that you find it. Things we find can add to what we know about these people. It all helps us get to know them more and more. The other thing is, there's a lot we don't know about these people because of the fact that it's really only stone that survives. Anything like wood or bone or other materials will have rotted away in 300,000 years. So all we find is the things that they made out of stone. So our job is kind of making a picture of what these people's lives were, just using a really small proportion of the things they actually produced. So it is quite difficult. And 
the more stuff we find, the more we can add to that, the more we can learn. You're an archaeology expert. Outside of this find, what are the big questions that you still really want answered? What are you? What would be a really exciting discovery for you to find anywhere in the world? Oh, that is an interesting question. So for me, oh, I don't know. That's quite a hard question to answer. For me, I think it would be quite exciting. Like I said, we usually only find stone tools. For me, I think it would be quite exciting to find the fossils of an actual human associated with the stone tools. Now, these tools, well, you've just said, we can only find what still is around, so what lasts through hundreds of thousands and millions of years. Um, How much of an idea do we have of what happened for most years of the Earth's existence? Like a million years ago, do we know what was happening there? Five million years ago, do we have a really good idea? Could there have been some secret world that maybe have slipped by us? Ah, so I think we've got a reasonably good idea of a lot of what was happening while human species were inhabiting the world. I don't think there are any hidden civilizations from the past that we haven't discovered. I think we would have seen some evidence if there was a great ice age civilization that we've never heard about. Ah, I mean, <laughs> you know, you don't want to get into these way out ideas, but it's always fun to kind of think about, right? Think think about these these strange human type creatures that have, could have had computers way smarter than we did <laughs> before we even realised it. Now, as an archaeology expert, I'm asking this because there's a big Indiana Jones film out at the moment. Oh, yeah. How how often does your job uh, or the job of an archaeologist take you into real dangerous situations like that? Or is more of it digging up random holes around the UK with Simon and his big digger and hoping you find some stone knives, which is amazing? Well, uh, Indiana Jones probably isn't that representative of what most of us do. And I, for one, I just tend to work in southern Britain, so I don't get to go on many foreign adventures. But I still find my job quite exciting. I still find it quite exciting to dig these holes in places where I know there might be archaeology. And I find it very exciting when I actually find something. So for me, as an archaeologist, I don't know if I need the Indiana Jones lifestyle to be really excited by my job. No, I think it would be really exhausting, actually, and a little, uh, just a little bit terrifying. Listen, just last question, looking into the future, have you got an idea of where you would like to dig next, what you're looking for in your next excavation and project? I think because I mostly work in southern Britain, and I think I'd like to carry on doing that, and I'm hoping that I'll carry on finding evidence of people that lived in Britain during the Ice Age, so more finds that we can put alongside these new artifacts we found to learn more about people, different species of human that lived in Britain during the Ice Age. It's been a real joy. Letty Ingray, thank you so much for being there. Thank you for having me on. For this week's Dangerous Dan, where we look at some of the most mean, strange, wicked and cruel but amazing things in the universe. We're headed into the ocean to talk about toxic slime. Green algae is a seaweed, very simple organisms that feed off the air in the water and the sunlight that ripples through the ocean. They can live on land too. There are about 22,000 species of green algae and it clumps together, grabbing onto rocks or trees near the sea. It looks and feels slimy and silky smooth. Some of it's fine, but lots of it can be deadly. Large amounts of the sludge together release hydrogen sulphide into the air, which is a poisonous gas that floats near the sky nearby, hovers around the beach, and sunbathers there won't have a clue. The toxic gas can make you fall unconscious. In the end, it can do much worse. It can even kill you. Now, in France a few years ago, this toxic algae took over trees and became so packed in 
the beaches had to be closed to save everyone from the hydrogen sulfide. So that's why this seaweed, and seaweed looks pretty creepy, right? It feels slimy and strange. It can be much worse. It's why this simple slime, green algae, the sinister sludge goes straight onto our dangerous down list. Before we go this week, just a very short trip, a little summer break to the smartest school in the solar system. So trap yourself in. We're heading to deep space high to learn about weather across the solar system. We're joining up with Sam, Stats and Quark, learning about how other planets are affected by space weather. Deep Space High Intergalactic Weather Watch. Jump into a wormhole and travel to deep space high. The school is in space. But hurry, because lessons are about to begin. Whoa! Here's a question, sir. Do all planets have weather? Are they affected by space weather? Well, every planet is different. You're lucky that on Earth the magnetic field acts like a shield to protect you from the solar winds. If you remember, some of the energy from the sun is helpful, like heat and light, which living things need. But solar wind carries a lot of radiation, or energy that could be harmful to life. But there's no life on other planets in Earth's solar system. Well, apart from us... That's true. There isn't life as far as we know, but it's something we need to consider if we're planning on visiting other planets. Come on, the best way to find out is to take a meteorological tour. Mercury. This is the baby of Earth's solar system and closest to the sun. Even though it has a magnetic field which protects the surface from solar winds, I'm not sure I'd want to visit. Yeah, it says the temperature out there is 400 degrees Celsius. That's four times as hot as boiling water. Venus is up next. It may be further away from the sun, but it's the hottest of all the planets. The heat is caused by an atmosphere that's choked with carbon dioxide and nitrogen. The temperature here is hot enough to melt lead. Hey, oh, it's starting to rain. We better get out of here. It's just rain. Um, rain on Venus is sulfuric acid. Another reason not to hang about is that although Venus's atmosphere offers some protection from solar winds, the planet doesn't have a complete magnetic field, which means living things are, well, affected by harmful radiation from the sun. Right, next, Mars. Mars is a bit more comfortable, but you still need a space suit. Its thin atmosphere means you can see sunrises and sunsets, but it's very cold and can get pretty windy, leading to horrible sandstorms. What about the solar winds? Does Mars have a magnetic field that makes it safe to be on the surface? There's only a very weak magnetic field, and that's something Earth scientists need to think about before they send astronauts to Mars. On our right is Jupiter, and there's Saturn. Both are gas giants. They have massive magnetic fields, and so don't get affected by solar winds as much as other planets. But if they're made of gas, doesn't that mean we can't land on them? That's right. And to be honest, they wouldn't be my chosen holiday destination. They're hot and stormy, and the atmospheric pressure would squash you flat as a pancake. Winds on Saturn can be around 1,800 kilometres per hour, and it's a toasty 15,000 degrees Celsius at the core. Stormy weather is pretty common on Uranus too. Lovely blue clouds of methane gas. But you'll need thermals, not sunblock. It's minus 200 degrees Celsius here. And Neptune's not much warmer. It's the furthest planet from the sun. And also the coldest, with temperatures plummeting to minus 224 degrees Celsius. And a bit windy too, with winds of over 2,000 kilometres per hour. Both Uranus and Neptune have magnetic fields that help protect from solar winds. Yeah, but like a lot of planets, they're just too hot or cold for anything to survive anyway. Well, as far as we currently know, Sam, don't forget living things can cope with very extreme weather conditions. So perhaps there are some surprises out there. But as you can see, magnetic fields are just one thing to think about when visiting other planets. You also need to think about the type of atmosphere, temperature... And whether there's anything to land on at all. Good point, Stats. Class dismissed. Deep Space High Intergalactic Weather Watch. With support from the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Find out more at fungislive.com slash space. And that's it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. Remember, you've got loads more of this podcast. 
by becoming a subscriber at Fun Kids Podcast Plus. Not just that, you've got tons more exclusive episodes for all of your favourite Fun Kids shows, and you can hear over 30 Fun Kids podcasts completely ad free. Now, if you've got a science question you want answered, make sure you leave it as a voice note on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen all over the country on your DAB digital radio, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>